Welcome back to World War II TV, folks. And we are in the middle of Operation Shingle Week. But actually, we're not really talking about that today because we mustn't forget that in between the Salerno landings and the Anzio landings, there was a hell of a lot of slogging over rivers and ridges that took place. And who better to talk about slogging over rivers and ridges and the, the battle we're going to be talking about today than Peter Hart, the author of Foot Sloggers, an infantry hey. battalion at war, 16th DLI, and we're going to talk about slogging over ridges and, and rivers and ridges. So uh, good afternoon, Pete. How are you today? I'm um, very good, very good. Uh, looking forward to chatting about this, yes, and being part of Operation Shingle. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and you are and you aren't. And th this is this is the, what we're going to try and cover today, is that those operations kind of bookmark a, a longer kind of a slogging winter, autumn, fall, winter campaign. But actually, for a lot of the units, they're just continuing to do the same thing they've been doing since since three months earlier, essentially. So um, I'm going to throw up a few maps and we'll set a bit of context. But once you know how, what Peter does on these shows, folks, we're going to kind of just let Peter tell us the stories of the guys who were there. But for a bit of context, for, we're talking about the um, the Bernhardt line. That This is what where the mountain range or the ridge range is that we're talking about. So this is after Salerno. You can see Salerno to the sort of bottom left, bottom right there, and Anzio sort of to the the left uh, there and in between that is what we're talking about today so do you want to kind of sum up what the 16th DLI have been doing sort of since uh, you know September October 43 yeah well they landed and uh, let's be honest they had a fairly easy landing compared to some compared to the Hampshires for a start uh, but then they'd had a lot of fighting on something called Hospital Hill at the back of Salerno uh, where they uh, were the beneficiaries of a, a jerk of those common words in, in any military history, a German counterattack. Uh, they'd managed to hold that off and then they'd exploited through, helped exploit through the ridges uh, behind uh, and, and onto the Naples plain. They'd then done the crossing of the Volturno, which was a hell of an operation. Perhaps one day we'll talk about that. And then they moved on to cross over the Tiana, which is, a, I believe, a tributary of the uh, Volturno, but somehow it got in their way again. But uh, geography isn't my strong point. And then they'd advanced forward. And it's then that they become aware of uh, the, the, the Bernhardt line. And in particular, what's important for us is the Monte Camino Massif. Now, this is not Monte Cassino. This is Monte Camino. And to the Durhams, it's their Monte, Monte Cassino. This is what, for them, is what mattered. They never get anywhere near Monte Cassino. But Monte Camino, it's bad enough. It really is woody. It, it's... Uh, it, it's just inland of the uh, the floodplain of the Garigliano, and uh, and I think one of the points I, I think I'd like to make while we're on the big maps and you know the big arrows all over the place, it's just what a bloody stupid campaign the Italian campaign is. Uh, I, I just think that we need to say it. I know I'm meant to be dealing with uh, ordinary soldiers, but this is the ordinary soldiers perspective what the bloody hell are we doing italy was already out of the war or it was after you know before we landed at uh, salerno um we're bashing our heads against river after river against ridge after ridge um we're not attracting any we're not really helping the overall strategic situation it's mission creep uh, the church churchill he'd managed to get the americans into it the americans were really focused on d-day as we should have been and a lot of this italian stuff and especially uh, operation shingle is attracting away um, um landing craft uh, air resources naval resources uh, and of course military resources generally that should have been focused on d-day um and that is my underlying perspective, and I think it's the underlying perspective of a lot of historians. I'm not saying the Italian campaign isn't interesting. I'm not saying Operation Shingle or what we're talking about today isn't interesting. What I'm saying is it's a bit like Gallipoli, really. It's just, you know, it's a sideshow and should have been left as such. Sorry. No, to, definitely, um, and and the point I want to skip, make, man. folks, is, is that we just Peter and me were just saying this before you we went live, is that we often treat these various battles as if they are completely separate. There's the first special service force we talked about yesterday going for Mount La Defensa. Then there's San Pietro to the north, Americans involved there. And Mark Clark's Fifth, fifth Army, you know, we, we break it down to these individual slugfests in some ways. But actually, there is a sort of broad 
front advance at least attempting to be going on and yet that map on the left there is really good because the unit we're talking about part of the 46th but connected in this case to the 56th and the and and you can see the, the variety of nations are involved we talk about monte casino as being an international operation but so is this isn't it it is and uh and, you know, sometimes we forget that uh, Mark Clark is the boss of Fifth Army and yeah. uh, and uh, he is the one. Uh, and before I, I again, I pay tribute to everybody else who's fighting in the same circumstances. So uh, 5th of November, there's a terrible two week battle or 11 day battle. I'm not good at dates and things uh, when 56th Division are try, try to storm Monte Camino, uh, just as the Americans are trying to, to, to storm uh, um, the, the hills just to the north that they, they, they're held but do you know they attack time and time and time again and i'll pay tribute to 56 div they're not what we're dealing with today but the, everything that happens to the 16th dli happens to them uh it, it's just murder um and let's look at the background perhaps you've been out i think you live in france so of course it never gets cold in france but if you've ever waited for a bus and had to wait 15 minutes in the freezing cold. And you've thought, my hands are a bit cold. Oh, my head's a bit cold, especially with this. Now imagine being outdoors, hail, sleet, snow, freezing cold. Uh, these operations we're talking about, they don't take part in the summer. This is November, December. It's December we're mainly talking about. It's bloody freezing. And you're out. You can't get warm. You've not got proper clothing because with the British Army. It's, a, it, it, it's just awful. And uh, so, uh, well, I better get on. The, after they've tried, uh, the 56th Division eventually give up. And they're ordered, everybody's ordered to do it again on the 2nd of, of December. This would be Operation Raincoat. Um, and this time, Was that two ironic, that name? <laughs> Calling an operation <laughs> something that most of the guys don't actually possess. <laughs> like Operation Armchair, op Operation Comfy Chair. It's, 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 if you were told the name of the operation, you're one of those bloody Tommies at the bottom of that. You you kind of raise your eyes, eyebrows, and go, for, "That's they're, they're taking the piss, sir." Uh, I'm not I'm not allowed to swear particularly on your show, but I would if I was a Tommy. Definitely express myself in the Anglo-Saxon about this. Um, that so um, this is Operation Raincoat to the north. We've mentioned it. The Americans are going to capture Monte La Defensa, uh, but two divisions this time are going to go in. Uh, they're going to have 820 guns to support them, which is a lot for the Second World War. But I mean, it's not like the the Great War where you get five or six thousand guns. This is quite a lot. Um, and what's going to happen is 56th Division are going to attack from the village of Calabretto up something evocatively, evocatively Woody called Bear Arse Spur or Ridge. It's called both. And they are heading up towards Monastery Hill. Um, meanwhile, the 46th Division would attack the previous day, i.e. The, the 1st of December, and they would clear away the uh, the various spurs and foothills. And if you look at that map, which you brilliantly put up, what we're talking about here is Pillbox Spur, uh, Bear Arse Spur, the lower reaches of it, Terrace Hill, and into the Calabrita Basin. That That's what's going to happen. And that's going to be done... Uh, um, on the night of the 1st of December by the 5th Sherwood Foresters, fine body of men, and 2nd 5th Leicesters. The 16th DLI are back in reserve at the village of La Marata, which I can't, there it is, right at the very bottom what of that right. map. Yeah. So I, I thought, and they're there, but that, that they, uh, they're going to, that, that's where they're going to be. Now, what happens? Well, at first, everything goes well. Uh, Pillbox Hill, which you can see there, I think. Now, yes, yep, there is Pillbox Hill. Pillbox, yep. Uh, that's taken no opposition, but when they attack towards Calabrito itself, it's an absolute disaster. Deep mud, barbed wire, minefields, machine guns, bloody mortars, more bloody mortars, sodding artillery, the lot coming down. Uh, and uh, the, 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 it's coming down from Terrace Ridge, which is not on that. Uh, and, and, I'll just and, put a photo in there. That's, that's the route towards Calabrito there. So that for those who want to get an idea of how straight up these ridges go that's that's the objective in the distance there and obviously this is a google uh street view going up a road we're going to be talking mostly going across. That was from la marata isn't it yeah so from la marata's behind what... yeah yeah uh so we're we're heading up those bloody big hills uh anyway the attack breaks down and uh and uh 
that night, 2nd of December, I mean, look at that. I, I mean, I'm going to, I'm sorry. <laughs> you just look at it. And think. Anyway, that night, 2nd of December, B Company is detached from the rest of 16th DLI and sent forward. And, and they march forward up towards Calabrito. They come under bloody awful mortar fire. And if you, if you hear anything about the fighting on these ridges, it's mortar fire. Of course, mortar fire, up, down. And this is, I'm going to do a quote now, uh, 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 a quote from Corporal William Ver, uh, 12 Platoon B Company. Uh, they've been forced to take cover in some old German slit trenches that they've meant, that have been overrun before. And this is what he says. And I just, can you, I'm not going to do stupid accents because this is not funny. People are dying. It's, it's like this. He says this, it came on absolutely bucketing down with rain, terrible weather. It just churned it all to mud. The slit trenches were half full of water. You, you were just sat in them trying to get a cigarette going, but you couldn't. Then they started mortaring us. Well, of course, they knew the exact range of these trenches because they were the ones that had dug them before they'd withdrawn higher up the valley. They were dropping these bombs all around, and luckily, half of them were dud. They weren't exploding because of the soft ground. A chap in the trench next to me, a bomb exploded and killed him. His mate with him was badly wounded. It was awful. Oh, I never did like mortar shelling. No one, by the no one likes mortar shelling, but you know, uh, because they come straight down. You could be in a slit trench, but it can drop in with you, whereas a shell at least comes down at an angle. You get the fragments from the mortar bomb, but also <laughs> all of the rock fragments as well, which doubles the effect of the shrapnel. Shattered rocks killing about. Fly, sorry, flying about will kill you just as well the pieces of metal if they hit you. And I, I just want you to picture being in a slit trench, a rocky slit trench, with this going on, mayhem going going all around. It, it's, it's, it's just awful. And Ver, Bill Ver, William Ver, he, he almost breaks down, and this is something he talks about a lot in his interview. Uh, he says this. If you're under a long bombardment, I think you go mad eventually. You, you go off your rocker. Every man has a different breaking point, and some go before others. You could never point the finger at anyone because he'd reached his breaking point. Yours, yours might be just a little further on, another half hour, and it might be you. Wow. You tend to be on the brink, and it takes all of your striving to prevent yourself from going to pieces. When you feel like letting everything go, gabbling and screaming, gibbering away, just letting go, you just curl up in a ball and hope nothing comes your way. I always lay on my left side and put my hands between my legs, my tin hat on the top, and hope for the best. I felt I was protecting myself a little bit. I probably wasn't. There was nothing you could do. And I think those two quotes together give you the perfect picture of what that must have been like. And mm. that's why I like oral history. Uh, could, could you put the exact date and something on it? Can you, I don't know. But uh, he was certain as to when it was, and it's a pretty noticeable action. So I think it definitely was. Anyway, the uh, B Company, they also have to fall back. They fall back on Pillbox Spur. It is on that map uh, again. Um, what's happened? Well, 139 Brigade, collectively, that's the Durham's Brigade, has had a bloody awful hammering. Uh, this is <laughs> courtesy of the 129th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, fine body of men, who were holding the Calabrito Basin area, just that whole bit. Sorry, I don't know why I'm doing that. <laughs> we're, I'm we're doing it on the map. Sorry, yeah. Um, and uh, um, But they'd done, they had done enough to secure the flank of 56th Division. And do you know what? That's what military operations are about. We've talked about this before. Yeah. You may be getting, you, you, you know, your, your ass kicked from here to buggery, so to speak. But actually, you're playing your part because it meant the 56th Division were able to get up uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the bridge towards Monastery Hill. Uh, so they go up and they, they actually take uh, up Bear Arse Ridge, what a great name, what a great name, it's so evocative, uh, up Bear Arse Ridge, and they take Monastery Hill, and they also take Point Eight One Nine, which I don't think is on that map or number down there. Um, so the 56th Division have got home, uh, in part thanks to the total failure of what 39 Brigade's attack. And it's at this point uh, that it all goes to hell on a, on a hindcart up there, because... We've looked at the pictures. You've shown some pictures. It's murder up there. It's mm. it's on top of a bloody mountain, a massif of sodding mountains. 
It's hell on earth. And the 56th Division are battering away, but the Germans will not give way. The Americans have taken Montelad Defensa. Let's not forget the, our allies' contribution, and I'm not going. We don't need bad mouth anyone here. They've done their bit. We're doing our bit. But the Germans are doing their bit, and the Germans are bloody difficult at times. Uh, you know, they're lovely now, but at the time they were quite difficult and uh, didn't always cooperate with our plans. Now, 5th of de de December, the 16th DLI are called upon to exploit the gains made by 56th Division. Uh, they were to take Cockerutzo Spur, which I can't see at the moment, but it's somewhere. It's 0 0.430 and 4.2i, and I know you've got a picture of them. Uh, uh, there there they are on the map there, 420 uh, and 430. You can see you can see them on the way uh, from Bear Arse Ridge, and that's a, a picture that you tell me is them. I wouldn't have known that. I, I've never been on the ground. I wish I, I'd love to go on Monte Camino. I really would. Anyway, they have a conference, and the Colonel of the Fifth Sherwood Foresters, uh, sorry, they have a conference with the Colonel of the Fifth Sherwood Forest, and the Colonel of the Sixteenth DLI, who's a chap called Johnny Preston. And he's a bright bunny rabbit, he is. Um, he really is. He's a good tactical leader. Drank a bit too much at times. Who's not in action, by the way, but oh. he liked to drink. But he was an excellent tactical leader. And he comes up a pl with a plan. He doesn't want to make a, a, a frontal at attack across the Calabrito Spur. What he wants to do is to go round. So he would follow a flanking march. He'd go They'd start at La Marata, and then they'd go all the way through the 56th Division area. They'd go all the way up Bear Ice Ridge, all the way up onto Monastery Hill, and then they'd swoop round to the uh, uh, the uh, west, east, yep. west, one of them, west. <laughs> they'd swoop round. I'm glad you weren't in charge of the map reading, Peter. <laughs> It's got, I'm really good with maps. They'd move down off uh, the, the hills onto point 430 and 42, essentially coming at them from, from, from the rear. Um, uh, it's a hell of a climb before you start. It's not easy going up them bloody hills, uh, but it did offer the chance of a tactical surprise. So you'd be coming at them from the, from the rear, so to speak. Company Sergeant Major... Uh, Leslie Thorntons, he was in the support company. He, I, I wish I'd interviewed him. It wasn't me. It was one of my colleagues who did him. He said, we were all concentrated at the bottom of this mountain. The battalion, the support company, ready to climb that mountain and get over the top. The night before, I think there were 650 guns of our artillery fired at that mountain. Every gun was used. The whole lot were firing. 7.2s, which are huge guns. The 5.5s, that's what the South Nazis are. had. They weren't there, but that's what they had. Um, the 25-pounders, that's bog-standard field artillery. And the Bofors guns, that's, you know what Bofors are. It was like bonfire night. The shells landed on this mountain. And next morning, we had to climb up. There's no roads. It's rough mountain paths. It's bloody steep and it's tiring. And remember, they've not got anyone to carry their gear, so they're carrying everything with them. Uh, so if you if you've if you've got a machine gun, if you've got to carry it and the ammunition, and you've got to take your rations, and you've got to take your there's rifle. Oh God! Now this is Lieutenant Russell uh, Collins of A Company. And uh, he's a cracking lad, he is. I remember I, I interviewed him when he was a lieutenant colonel. And he was quite stiff then, but he was quite a character when he was young. There he is. That's him, the cheerful-looking one who looks about 12, right in the middle. Uh, well, clearly the officer. <laughs> and uh, that's his lads. That's his platoon. He was a cracking bloke. And he looks, as I say, about 12. How old would you say he was, Woody, looking at that? 18, 16, yeah. 17? <laughs> yeah. Just a kid. Young. He says this, it was like scree, very rough and broken ground. There were very steep, steep tracks. And, of course, we were carrying full battle order, 48 rations, full water bottles, and a full load of ammunition. There was no possibility of any motor transport going up there, so we had pack mules, which took the heavy stores up. Yeah, not for many of them. Going up this winding track all through the night with periodic breaks of five or ten minutes each hour and so on, with the mules going along beside us, going up as quietly as we could. By the morning, we got up to the high ground, unobserved, the enemy quite un unaware as far as I know. So they got round behind them. Uh, they got to 0.683, which is the furthest point taken by the guards, 
the guard, fancy the guards being in proper fighting. I'll tell you, you know. Uh, there it is. Can you see 0. 0.683 to the left of Monastery Hill? It's the and you can see they're up above and they're going to attack towards Hill 430 and 420. Uh, they the rest of the day they stay out of sight, they gather their forces, they rest, then they get ready for the attack. Uh, the officers wrecky the ground, of course they do. And um, the first attack on 0. 0430 would be made at dawn on the 6th of December by a C company, and then. A Company, which is um, Russell Collins' company, um, commanded by Major Ray Mitchell, they would leapfrog through to take a small promontory with, a, again, a great name, British Army, I love it, called Dick. <laughs> um, now, they, they attack, but they're forced to ground by heavy uh, small arms fire, including machine gun fire. And at this point, 2nd Lieutenant Russell Collins and his men, they take cover behind some boulders and a sort of low dry stone wall. And if, if you come from County Durham, like I do, you can picture the dry stone wall. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And here they're pinned down. And every move they make meets, they get a storm of small arms and machine gun fire. And and it's at this point that I, I've got the highest regard. I think we'll have a picture of him come up, if you can put him back up, of 2nd Lieutenant Russell Collins, uh, if you can find the picture of him again. Because this this is this is the stuff of, of, uh, of legends. Uh, and he was a legend in his unit. His nickname was Winkler Collins. He got that because he'd led an attack that took out a whole load of dugouts and winkled the Germans out in the crossing of the Volturna. Um, and he said this, and this is an officer who definitely leads from the front. He said, I spotted where this fire was coming from, about 80 to 100 yards to our right as we were going across. A lot of fire was coming from there, like a crofter's small farmstead. I was so incensed, really very angry that some of my chaps were being hit. One very nice lad, Private Jimmy Baglin, was hit and died subsequently. Ray Mitchell, that's his major, was there wondering quite what to do, I think. I'm not surprised. I said, this is, this is a bit, I said, well, look, I think I'd better go and sort it out. Will you let me go? And he said, and this is a British officer at his best, good Lord, if you want to, sooner you than me. <laughs> and I said, I'll take a small, lit, a little small assault party round to the right flank. He said, well, all right, good luck. I set, I set up a machine gun post to fire back at these people to keep their heads down. While I moved with two or three chaps, my Batman, Phillips, uh, Corporal Clayton was another, and I handpicked about three or four men. Now, he won't delegate at this stage of his career. Uh, in his very first action, he'd cocked up and got half his platoon killed. It wasn't his fault. It was friendly fire, but he would led them somewhere that they weren't expecting, and he got, you know. Uh, he always wanted to leave from the front. Later in the war, he loses his nerve a bit and he, he goes in second. That's what, you know. But at this point, he'll always go first. And he says this. This is Russell Collins. It, it, and there he is. Look at him and think about how, what his age is. He's about 19, 20. Uh, it depends so much on the individual. Some officers might make the plans. This is the, par the, pl this is the plan, Sergeant. I can do the covering fire from here and you take the assault party round there. That was not my way. Rightly or wrongly, I led from the front whenever possible. I felt more confident that way. I felt it was my duty. To tell you the truth, I really felt I couldn't send somebody else there if I wasn't prepared to do it myself. I nearly always led from the front. In the war, the dominant lesson I learned was the crucial role of the junior officer because it was quite clear to me that unless platoon commanders led their platoons, nothing happened now that's unfair to decent sergeants and and junior ncos who sometimes would take the lead but it is also very true in the history of the 16th that if nobody takes the lead nothing much happens somebody has to go forward now so they've got machine gun fire and rifle fire from behind the dry stone wall providing covering fire and uh, collins lunges off to the right uh, towards this 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 farmstead. And it's a desperate business. He describes it. We went round to the right flank. I wanted to get on with it. I went positively. You might say impetuously. But anyway, straightforwardly. As I ran into the target area, onto which our machine gun was still firing rapid rate, the bullets were cracking over my head. But I think they saw us just in time. 
When I got round the side of the building, I saw that there was no ground entrance, but there was an outside staircase. I rushed straight up the staircase, and there was a door open at the top. I was aware of the danger of going into an open doorway, but somehow I established that there was nobody in that upper room. When I looked over the sort of parapet where I was standing at the top of this stairway and down behind was an extension to the farm building, a, a cow shed or something like that. It was clear then that the enemy were all in there. I was standing about 10 feet above them. I opened up with my Tom, a to, a Tommy gun, Thompson, um, down through the slates or tiles of the roof. And I ordered my other chaps around the side of the staircase to my left. There they were standing outside the door with their rifles at the ready. And I was standing up above firing down. What came out through the door was a white flag on the end of a rifle banner because there was absolutely nothing else they could do. We shouted to them to come out with their hands up. They came out, something like 16 or 18 of them. I'm afraid that when we lined these prisoners up, if any of them had a camera or anything like that, which we did, which, which we didn't want to fall into the hands of the people guarding the prisoner of war camps behind, we helped ourselves. Uh, we felt that we were more entitled to them than they were perhaps slightly reprehensible in some ways. Among them was a camera, and I took some snaps there and then. Then we dug in, consolidated the position, and had a brew up. And I love that final okay, cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. But what an account. And I don't know how you feel about when you hear things like that. I mean, it's just brilliant, isn't it? I mean, it goes back to even what the, the commanding officer said, the major said, you know, well, you know, if you want to kind of thing, you know, that it almost sounds like Major Bloodnock in the goons talking to, it, it's, it, <laughs> there's a farcical element alongside this incredible bravery that I find is so, something very typical about British squaddy oral histories and, and, and what you do so well in your books is that it, it balances all these things at the same time. There's incredible bravery, but there's this, unrelenting humour and silliness about the way they talk about it in some ways. Uh, that, that, that's the point. Because it, it, it is. It, it is a strange... Um, I mean, this is what warfare is like. There's these moments of incredible tension and, and horror and people are being killed that you know, which doesn't happen to us very often, does it? Um, although at my age, it's going to happen increasingly often. <laughs> um, but... Um, this is a very different thing. I mean, look at the ages of the lads in there. I think the sergeant there gets, I mean, one of his sergeants gets killed. You know, it, it, the, these, not all those guys in that lovely, happy photo make it to the end of the war. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and Russell Collins does, uh, obviously, or I wouldn't have interviewed him. Um, um, but they, they take this farmstead and, uh, and he gets the MC, military cross his performance that day and other performances and he, he makes a point it is important to the young officers like him it does mean something people talk about them coming up with the rations especially in the great war but it actually means a lot to those lads who get these medals and you know you, you shouldn't be too snow i'm not i know you're not but people shouldn't be too sniffy about these things uh mm. it matters to the guys so what happens well while A Company is dealing with this flanking German strong point, um, it's to the right of Dick, <laughs> childishness, see? Um, D Company was sent into the left uh, uh, of, of, of C Company. And they, they together, they, they, the uh, Hill 430 is taken. And then there's a final assault launch at 1430 that day. And they take Dick and point 420. Uh, assisted, and I want to make this clear uh, because I. All the time, I want it, nobody is acting on their own. They're assisted by a heavy barrage supplied by the 25 pounders of the 70th Field Regiment, uh, and 70, and also smoke uh, shells uh, fired by their own three-inch mortars from the support company. This is, I mean, this is how warfare works. It's all joined together up thinking. This is why we couldn't do it, because we think, as historians of whatever merit we have, that that, that we understand warfare. Well, we don't because we don't actually have the grip of all the sub-disciplines that are essential. Uh, we don't really understand uh, how, how to get all these things. How do, how do you communicate? How do the 25 pounders not hit your own men? How do the three... It, it, it's all so complicated. Um, anyway, the, the strong points finally stormed and they establish uh, defensive positions all around uh, 420, uh, 430 uh, and Dick. Uh, the support company come through 
and they've been struggling up, and it's an absolute bloody channel uh, thing because they've been fighting all the way from the top of uh, not them, but th there's been fighting by the 56th division, remember, on Bar, Bar, Bar Ars Spur or Ridge, whatever you want to call it, and then all the way round behind where, where, where they've come from, uh, 0.683 and the rest of it, they've been through, uh, uh, yeah. And this is what uh, Company Sergeant Major Leslie Thornton, support company, says. We finally got to the top. The carnage. There was guardsmen hanging out of holes in the ground. There was Germans lying all over. There was still some rifle fire. They were disposed of. And we started our climb down to the valley. That's down behind uh, towards 420. Uh, the, this bar Now, I like this. This barbed wire on my neck is carrying a reel a real of barbed wire was bouncing up and down, and it wasn't very comfortable at all. You believe me, especially going down. It wasn't so bad going up. Eventually, we got to the bottom. It was getting light. On we went to where I had to put my company headquarters in the valley. We halted there and waited for orders. I saw two bodies lying on the ground. Sergeant Kennedy, a friend of mine from Bishop Auckland, dead, and his corporal lying beside him. They'd been caught by German machine gunners and hit in the head. We buried them there, shallow graves, took their discs and put their gas capes over them and marked it so that the Padre would come along later, uh, see them, and they'd be moved. Now, this this struck a chord with me because my I, my family are from Bishop Auckland. My dad went to oh. school in Bishop Auckland. My dad might have known Sergeant Kennedy. I'm not saying he did, but he was the same age. Um you know, and uh, this brings it home to you when when you just see these people uh, dying on the battlefield, and then they're just buried in shallow graves, and then eventually they're all consolidated together. You could, and people have done, write books about how that's all done. Uh, it's just another part of it. Um, so on seventh of September, C Company uh, advanced to the left from point four twenty all along the Cockerutzo Spur and take the village of Cockerutzo, and that was the battalion's final objective. Um, by twelve o'clock that day, they've secured it and the Germans fall back. And what they've got is they've got a domination of the whole of the Calabrito Basin, that whole basin in front of the, the massif of Monte Camino itself. And that meant supplies, instead of going all the way up Bayer Ars Ridge, they could actually go straight across from La Marata, across the valley and up. Uh, it, it was a lot easier for them. What happens to the battalion? Well, they get a short rest because uh, they're all absolutely buggered. And I, I remember that Thornton, I remember listening to the tape. I did an interview with Thornton. Uh, uh, he went to sleep and where they'd been put was in, 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 in uh, next to a barn. I don't think they were all in the barn. And where they went to sleep, he said there was a battery of 4.5-inch uh, guns. He said he didn't hear them. You know. Wow. He was so bloody knackered. Um, and it, it's just one more terrible battle. And you've you've seen the book. I'm not sure whether you, you know. But for, 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 for the infantry, for, for people who are involved in these battles, this is just one of a sequence of awful bloody battles. Uh, and that's what I want people to think about when yeah. we think about the infantry it's not just going over the top one day this is one battle and then you know, a bit of a rest and you're holding a line bloody german counterattacks and then another then a river crossing then a ridge and then then an attack on a farmhouse and then a defend of the farmhouse a bloody germans counterattack again and and then on to the next ridge across another bloody river and, you know and they, they they used to joke especially actually when they're on the other side uh, on the uh, the gothic line I used to joke that there was the bastard Germans with huge bulldozers digging out new rivers and new ridges in front of them. But I mean, it, it, we've not. This was a short talk, if you like. But um, we can talk a bit more about what it means. Well, but I mean, we just this, had the question that I think you kind of touched on it. HG is saying, "What was the strategic significance of Monte Camino?" Well, none in the sense, in in a sense, on its own, but it's part of a line that the Germans keep falling back to line after bloody line, don't they, basically? It is. Well, it's it's essentially, it's tactical significance. There's no strategic in, Yeah. but it's yeah. tactically, it's in front of Monte Cassino. And you have, before you can attack Monte Cassino, you've got to take Monte Camino. But it, I mean, we all know that 
awful fighting and the, the heroic performance of the, the various divisions and the Poles and the rest of it capturing and, and everybody else capturing Monte Cassino. But before you can do that, you've got to take Monte Cassino. Uh, and uh, and uh, and also you've got to take a forward. You see, there you go. I've forgotten the, the name of what the Americans, uh, mo, mo, uh, the, the, the mountain that they captured. I'm not going to look it up. I'm going to leave it um, as that point in that we're all a little bit overly interested in our own country at some time because there's the americans they've just captured a bloody great mountain that's just as big just as yeah. bad and it's all part of the same the same thing uh um, well that, that's why i wanted to bring you on for this because you know i had my salerno week and then i had my anzio week as if there's nothing going on in between those events well as we've made the point there's a hell of a lot going on um and and it's just a continuation of the same old shit, different day, different ridge. As you say, the fact they even were thinking the Germans are going out of bulldozers, digging new rivers, gives you an idea of the mindset of these guys. Is because you know we have the ability to kind of go on our maps and see that there is sort of an end in sight. Yeah, you, but but for these guys, it would just be get over one ridge. Oh bloody hell, there's another one and another one, and they kind of keep getting bigger. And because the further north you get towards the Alps, it's not like anything's getting easier. It's just going to get worse. I mean, the Durham's after they get a rest for a few days, and then they're sent across to Garigliano, and they're on the left hand. They're on the left hand side in a, a horrible mountain range, um, uh, you know, and 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 they just sit there. They they have no part to play in Monte Cassino because actually in February they're pulled back and sent back to the Middle East uh, where they rebuild, uh, and they need bloody rebuilding because they 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 to use a highly technical term buggered. Um, it's a good time to ask you the question, Stuart Burbridge asked. Um, what proportion of the 16th Battalion were Durham natives by this point of the war? Not high. Uh, we learned on the, f the first day of the Somme with the PALS battalions that, that uh, very few British battalions by this time are entirely from where they're from. So, I mean, the 16th DLI were built round a, a, a draft from uh, Hertfordshire. Um, mm. um, uh, yes, uh, they get influx from the the, uh, the 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 Durham Depot, which was at Brant Brantsburg Castle, and um, I've said Brantspeth, Brantspeth Castle. Uh, but they th that's not on that map. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, they um they they they're they're from anywhere. So you you know we, we they're, for, they're so I, I, I'm I'm not good at percentages. Uh, a third. Okay. Uh, but they, they they do have a Durham character, and uh, like Laurie Stringer, the guy who uh, wrote the the, the history, he hadn't joined at this point. Uh, he jo only joined in uh, forty four, I think, uh, in the Gothic line fighting, or is it forty three? Anyway, I can't remember. Um, he um, he became totally. He said when he arrived, he couldn't understand a bloody word that <laughs> some of them were, were saying because D Durham dialects can be quite difficult, mm. especially up the valleys. Um, but by the end, he could understand everybody, and he was a, a fanatical Durham. You know, to the end of his life, he was a fanatical Durham. He lived in London, <laughs> wow. you know, and there were lots of lots of them come from London, from Hertfordshire. There was a Welsh. There's they've come from all over, but there is a, a would you call it a spine? There's 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 a, a substantial contribution of Durham lads. Mm. Uh, well, we've talked about this before. You can have Welsh units had a Welsh identity, even if they weren't Welsh. You adopt. It's kind of, they're kind of adopted by the traditions of the regiment. So, you know, the, yeah. the, the number of Welsh guys actually eating leeks on St. David's Day doesn't need to be high for the sense of it to be important to all those who are there. And I think that's the point we're at by this point in the war. But I want to tell you about something you said earlier, Peter, about, about the idea that the Italy campaign is a bit of a... It's a bit bewildering, to put it politely. You know, exactly. I know there's a lot of hindsight, a lot of 2020... Monday morning quarterback, as Americans would say. But in all your interviews of these guys, not just the 16th, but others, do you think anybody who was fighting in the Italian campaign at the time or even after the war ever tried to kind of understand and, and be critical of what they were doing? I mean, because or is just the day-to-day -day misery more important to them to gripe about than actually kind of some tactical overview? I think they don't have a tactical or strategic overview uh, right. like that. They just don't. Uh, some of the officers... Uh, may have understood it. Um, what I know, there was incredible um, um, resentment at the D-Day Dodgers business. Yeah. Uh, and they they referenced that. That was a stupid thing for someone to say because uh, that that was just not on. Um, and uh, I've forgotten who said it. It was a lady. Nancy Astor, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, that's right. Well, she was known to say stupid things. 
Um, yeah. and, and that was a stupid thing to say. Um, they, it's quite interesting when, when they, like it's when they came back from Greece, because they went to Greece as well, after they fought the Gothic line and up the right hand side, they were sent to Greece in December, uh, 1944. And then they heard they were going back to Italy and they're, they're sort of going, I don't know, I'd rather be sent to the Western front. And then they think well, by Western front, I mean, uh, uh, the main, uh, the D -day, the sub -day, D day and follow ups normally uh, alone, yeah. And 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 then they thought, well, we know we know what we're doing here. It might be different there, you know, because it, it it was different. Um, and basically, they they didn't enjoy it. Uh, they didn't understand it. It's me who doesn't like the Italian campaign, and I I suspect that's because, uh, as some of you may know, I'm a First World War historian, and I don't like sideshows. Um, the American, it isn't, by the way, all uh, American quarterback thing because the Americans fought against Italy from the start. True. Uh, yeah. They didn't want to be involved and they warned what would happen. There were other people who said, this is, you know, you're going to end up in trouble. Um, but there's an element of, of it's a gamble. Really it's a gamble that they, they yeah. you know, there's an the element of analysis of the Italian campaign in that kind of post Dieppe idea of trying to find the positives out of something you know well we did learn this and you know like when you say like, people talk about the german luftwaffe that's worn down and the divisions that are taken to italy that could have gone elsewhere. yes they are all if you like fringe benefits of the campaign but it doesn't take anything away from well the word that came up with alex kershaw on monday and brad yesterday was the mismanagement of the italian campaign which is an odd one to talk about a military campaign but it, it does make you scratch your head a bit and wonder what what the thought what the thoughts were behind any of it you know landing oh. them one place and then kind of not abandon that but then do another landing up the coast because the first one hasn't quite gone the way we wanted it to and then the, then there's the one across from uh, sicily as well where the, it it does all seem a bit well there ends up being four, four landings don't there because there's yeah. sicily then there's uh, the two and then there's uh, uh, operation shingle and the thing is what 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 do, what do you need for D-Day? You need those those landing craft. You need that yeah. stuff. You need those resources. Um, I, I I mean the Italian campaign is is fascinating, but it, it is sort of mission creep. You know we've got to take Sicily. Why? Well, we've got to free up the Mediterranean, and now we've got it. Let's uh, let's take let's knock Italy out of the war, and then Italy's out of the war. Well, let's let's uh, let's keep going, and in the end. It, it 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 is a terrible campaign. Um, I'm not. I think uh, it's it's beyond my pay scale uh, as a Second World War historian because I'm not um, to really make a final judgment of it. I, as a First World War uh, historian, look at it and think, I don't know what they're doing, and uh, this seems to be a cr tremendous waste of resources that could be devoted. I don't think they attract. I think those German divisions would have been there anyway. Mm. Uh, most of them. Um, I mean that that's a debate for another day, and, and, and there's no complete resolution to it because it's no. like you know the the was pattern the brilliant or awful debates. There's people have their entrenched views, and that's it. So the Italian campaign will be talked about some positively and some negatively. People like Mark Clark are go through various uh, appraisals with the generations of being being good, bad, indifferent, but they carry on. But the focus of this, when we bring you on, is always experience of the poor bloody infantry. And that and that is a constant. That, that doesn't matter which war you're talking about. And we were talking before going line, you're on the Sudan campaign, 1888. I guess there's parallels. It's always miserable if you're if you're an infantryman. It that that's that's the thing. And it it you know, I mean, I've did, as you know, I did books on the artillery, the South Not Sars, fine body of men, and that. You know, you you realise that they come under a lot of shell fire. They do because other guns aim at guns first. First and foremost, they do. Uh, uh, then we did the tanks and the horror of being in a burning tank, or the the mm -hmm. just sheer drama. But the tanks don't fight anything like as much as the infantry. And the infantry just seem to have the worst of all worlds. They're, they're, they're continuously in action almost. Yes, I know they come in and out of the line, but they're in there for weeks at times. Yeah. Uh, they're, physically, it's hard. Uh, mentally, it's very hard. A lot of the DLI become very edgy. A lot of shell hole dropping towards the end. Do you know what I mean by that? It's first yeah. World War term. But, you know, the officer and the sergeant go forward and, there's people dropping out, you know, uh, helping the wounded uh, that aren't wounded, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't blame anybody, by the way, for that, for any response. Well, let, let's touch, because you said about Lieutenant, Lieutenant Miller, isn't it? Russell, Russell Miller. Russell, Ru, 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 
Russell Collins. Russell yeah. Collins, that's right, yeah. Let's talk about that because you said that later on he struggles because in a book of, uh, and I'll hold it up again, folks, Foot Sluggers, Infantry Behind at War, 1939 to 45, Peter Hart. You, you, it could just be full of, it was bloody awful, it was raining, it was cold, it was a trench, mortars coming in, pushing up the hill. And there is a lot of that in there, but there has to be some kind of, change in the narrative and i think the, the the change to human beings is something that you identify you see it in you 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 can talk about what they say in interviews so so what happened to him because um and, and how well, do you he, explain him he, he carried on doing incredibly well right up until um right up to uh just before they go to so uh, around about november uh 44 so that means he's been in he was at salerno yeah. So he, he goes right the way through. Remember, he's young. I don't know how. I can't remember. How. He's about 19 or 20 at most. We can see. Yeah. Um, he's only about five foot three as well. <laughs> and um, and in his last attack that he, he makes, it's funny, he's in action again, but it's the last attack he has to lead. He just says to himself, I can't do it. I can't lead this one. I'm going to ask the sergeant to do it, which, by the way, is what an awful lot of second lieutenant, well, by then he's a lieutenant, it's what a lot of them do. He's with the carrier platoon then, but they're dismounted carrier platoon. And he, he orders, he orders this, he does the plan. He's done the recce himself, but he can't quite face going over the top of himself. Mm. But the, 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 the thing that makes that story is he follows up immediately. And as he follows up, he walks around the corner and a bloke shoots at him, one of his own side. He said, I could have been killed. <laughs> the only time I don't do it, I nearly get shot by me outside. And that's one thing about warfare is you can't tell what's going to happen. So, you, you you know, you can't, the, there's no easy way. But I've got the highest regard for him. I always found it strange he finished up a colonel. Uh, yet he, he, he was, a, you know, he was such, such a, a top veteran. I mean, all the unit talk about Winkler Collins, all of them. No one's got a bad word to say about them. Now, in the infantry, unlike in the tanks and the artillery, there are, I mean, people have got killed due to officers making mistakes. And there are, there are, uh, if you've seen the book, there are certain figures who get a lot of hammer from the lads. Uh, I don't particularly want to name them because it's not right, but um, they, they get a lot of hammer, but no one ever said a bad word about Russell Collins. And to, to me, I just admired him and his courage and his determination, but also the reality of that in the end, well, also the fact he cocked up right at the start. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the fact he became a brilliant soldier and then by the end he was starting to suffer mentally. Well, uh, I mean, that that's the takeaway, isn't it? Is that how, why on earth would we expect anybody any human being to become naturally proficient at war. I mean, war is an inherently inhumane, destructive, terrible thing. And the, the tools, the skills you need to show to be good at it shouldn't come natural to us, should they? I mean, I don't want them to become natural. I mean, you know, so it, it's no bloody wonder these guys, it's two steps forward, one step back, and it's a massive great learning curve and an emotional um, journey there on, and I'm sounding like I have a psychiatrist now talking to someone. But it, you know, I, when it, whenever I'm getting stuck in one of my conversations about the, the use of troops, and should we have gone this way? Should that division have been used over on there? And so I kind of try and pull myself back and think, but you know, what was I like at 21 years old? What, what, how would I have been in this? You know, we, we couldn't, I, I look at a map like you and I have to think, is that East or that West? These guys are doing it under fire, right? They're doing that. And if you, if you get, if they get it wrong in that situation, if, if they just suddenly say East when they mean West and a stonk comes in at the wrong place or patrol goes off the wrong way, men die. If I fuck up doing World War II TV, I start late. Someone's camera doesn't work. No one dies. No, no. It's the responsibility these guys, these guys had and the, the potential disastrous outcome of a tiny, tiny, insignificant decision being made or or, or mistake, an error being made. And a lot of them talk about it. It's a very old analogy about a well of courage. And you can go to yeah. the well too often. You've only got so much inside you so many times you can go over the top leading and that's what happened to russell collins he, he actually mentions it that that the, the, the well was running dry it didn't run dry by the way he didn't become you know but there are references to officers who couldn't cope officers who broke and ran uh thank goodness in the second world war they were just taken out of the line and reassigned but there were people who couldn't cope 
Um, and I interviewed a couple of the lads who were, had to be sent back and they, you know, they, 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 they just couldn't cope. They couldn't cope yeah. anymore. And, and nobody should ever blame them because we've never had, or most of the people listening to this have never had anything like this happen to us. Um, exactly. I mean, the worst thing that happened to us is COVID, which is, a, you know, a, a, you know, a nasty illness that we clearly didn't die of. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, yeah, well, people did, but we, I, we, we ourselves. Oh no, did. we did. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But, um, a quick question: As you, you know, you talk about yourself as being a great war historian. We've just, you know, more or less said that the mindset of a Tommy in terms of having to learn war wouldn't have changed much from 1914 to 1940. But were there any broad, sweeping changes in the way infantry got things done from the Great War to the Second World War? that you see or, or, or was there something that should have been done? You know, well, I, I'm, I'm one of those first of all historians who think that the 1918 British army was probably the most efficient, uh, most deadly kill them all. Yeah. Wep, uh, army that there has ever been, uh, the, the, the British, sorry, that the British ever had. Uh, I do also think that in 1939, we comprehensive. And, and again, I don't want to upset people, but I think we'd comprehensively forgot nearly all of it we'd forgotten uh, the importance of uh, air cooperation we'd forgotten the importance of concentrating artillery uh, i mean people go on about jock columns jock columns in the they're just stupid they're just little penny packets of artillery mm. artillery is no good it needs to be massed together um but we did learn and you know in 44 by you know in normandy we start to become i mean even if you if you look um um Epson, uh, yeah, Epsom, almost no infantry tank cooperation. You know, um, Goodwood still not much. But later, by the time you get to uh, Blue Coat, the infantry start to work with tanks. Do you yeah. see what I mean? So, but, but we honestly, the Allies we start, did keep having to relearn. I mean, and I think that, but that's the that's the whole human thing about history, isn't it? You know, we we keep repeating the the mistakes, same mistakes, or there are the echoes of the past being repeated all the time that that's i suppose what keeps military historians in a job i suppose if that well you you can't help but make me say for a start there's something called skill fade uh, yeah. which which affects us i mean even like i can't remember how to set up my bloody things which is why i'm my, my look strangely lit uh, or perhaps i'm set too far back actually <laughs> um but skill fade is real for, for for soldiers just as it is for everybody else and there's all sorts of things that 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 just make it really really difficult to to, to pass on and people get old and and what you did in your day isn't always necessarily right funnily enough it it was 1918 would have been a good place to start in in, in sorting out but we didn't we started from well, we, I don't know where we started. We just started from a mess, didn't we? Uh, I'm not a fan of the 1939 army. Uh, well, no, I, think no, I don't we... think anybody is. Rob Lyman and, and Richard Dannett talked about that recently. It, it's it's a you know in their book, it's a the re, the analysis of that 90. We're going off down a massive rabbit hole now about the the, the arc of development or or undevelopment of the British Army between, in the interwar period. But we'll, we'll basically we'll bring it to an end now and say. Um, thanks very much, Peter, for being on there. We'll invite you back again. Don't forget, folks, the links to Peter and Gary's podcast in the description below. The links to the book is in the description below, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anything else you want to plug while you're here? Yes. I want people to vote for me in Military History Magazine uh, for my book, Foot Slogger. So if you look right, at that. Right, there you are, folks. Go out and watch it. There's there's a good few of you, a few dozen of you watching now. There'll be a few more hundred watching in the next few days. Go to Military History Magazine and vote for Peter's book so it goes up the charts and you win. Will you win a medal or something? Will you get a hat? No, I, I, I don't know what I win, but uh, I mean, I know I'm in battle with uh, what's his name, James, lovely, lovely James Holland, who, by the way, I've got the highest respect for. So I'm not anticipating winning against James. So, yeah, I, he's, I just he's, realized yeah. having mentioned that a lot of them are going to go off to what well, must go and vote for James. He's playing, you know, it could be a tie, they can do a bit of playoff. I'd, I'd watch a playoff between you and yeah, James in head, the final. Head, son. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good luck uh, with the rest of the year. I want to go and see your punk band at some point. I was showing my mate Colin clips Those of you. Naughty lumps. They're not those naughty lumps because this, your, your music is right up my alley as well. But, folks, fantastic, fantastic questions and comments coming in. I will see you all again tomorrow when Mag and I are plugging our Normandy tour, which will be at 7 p.m. UK time. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody. I will see you all again later. This is Paul Woodhouse for World War II DV saying enjoy the few hours you have before I'm back again. Cheers, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Cheers.